king eyes are turning to you we turn to you oh mystery hearts are yearning for you we long for you when we see you we find strength to face the day in your presence all our fears are washed away washed away oh say oh say you are the God who saves us Worthy of all our praises Hosanna Hosanna Come every way among us Reign in our hearts, Lord Jesus
to sing and all thanks to Jesus oh I am redeemed he gives grace upon grace like rivers flowing mercy so new hear there every morning God made a way when there was no way I could that's just who he is he's just that good he's just that good i can't hide it i believe i know my father's love for me i won't be quiet i will sing of all my God has done for me I can't hide it I believe I know my Father's love for me I won't be quiet I will sing of all my God has done for me I praise God for all He's done Rivers flowing, mercy so new. With every morning, God made a way when there was no way I could. That's just who He is. He's just that good. He's just that good. He's just that good. Mercy's new every morning, grace overflowing like rivers. We have so much to thank him for. And as we sing these next songs together, I would just invite you to think and reflect upon the goodness of God in your life, what you have to be grateful for and thankful to him for this morning. Filled with his praises One day when sin was As black as could be Jesus came forth to Be born of a virgin Dwelt among men My example is he The word became flesh And the light shined among us His glory revealed Living, he loved me. Dying, he saved me. Buried, he carried my sins far away. Rising, he justified. Really, forever. One day, he's coming. Oh, glorious day. Oh, glorious day. that healed nations stretched out on a tree and took the nails from me living he loved me dying he saved me buried he carried my sins far away rising he justified freely forever 
one day he's coming oh glorious day oh glorious day Pour out our 
About a month ago, I, I started a series that I titled the Practicing the Presence of God in Our Lives. And the series came about because over these years, I've seen so many believers in this church that know their Bibles and uh, they're willing to serve the Lord. But whenever a crisis comes, they're filled with anxiety, worry, and fear. And you wonder about that. And so I thought maybe it's the idea that they are struggling maintaining the day-to-day, moment-by-moment presence of God in their lives. And so the first week, I talked about the idea that we can strengthen ourselves through prayer. We often think that prayer is just tell God the list you have and see what he does. That's not prayer at all. Prayer strengthens us. David was strengthened at the lowest point in his life through prayer. Paul was strengthened, and he entreated the Lord three different times to remove remove the thorn in his flesh. God said no, but Paul was strengthened. Then, second week, I said we need to live with a prevailing attitude of gratitude. We need to be thankful people. And the Bible is clear. We need to thank God for all things and in all things, which is something we rarely do. The third week, I said that we need to be careful of small sins in our life, particularly that week of lying, as though it's a small thing. And some of us become habitual liars, and we don't really confess that to God at all. We just think, well, everybody does it, and that's okay, but that breaks our fellowship with God. Then last week, I said we needed to cultivate a pervasive attitude of joy in our lives, by remembering God's presence, God's precepts, God's providence, God's provision, God's protection, and God's promises. In other words, we have to remember, and that led to this final sermon in this series, we have to remember, we have to to call all of this to our mind. You see what it really comes down to? You are what you think more than you think you are. The biggest enemy in your life is your thought life. Proverbs 23, 7, for as he thinks within himself, so he is. That's all of us. By the way, everybody knows that. It doesn't really matter. The Hindus teach man becomes that which he thinks. The Buddhists teach the mind is everything, what you think you become. Marcus Aurelius said, your life is what your thoughts make it. Descartes, of course, in his famous line, I think, 
therefore I am. William James, the American philosopher, said, the greatest discovery of my generation is that human beings can alter their lives by altering the attitudes of their mind. And British philosopher James Allen said this, we cannot overcome anxiety unless we learn to replace worried thoughts with worthy thoughts. Thoughts that come directly from the mind of the God of peace. Hmm. Turn with me to Isaiah chapter 26. Isaiah 26 and verse 3. This is a promise that Isaiah, God makes through Isaiah to us. And it's an interesting thing. It's something that we should certainly think about. Isaiah 26, 3 says, The steadfast of mind you will keep in perfect peace. Why? Because he trusts in you. Trust in the Lord forever, for in God the Lord we have an everlasting rock. Whenever we start falling apart, the one thing we don't have is peace. We don't. We just constantly keep, and where does that anxiety come from? Our thoughts. We start thinking and sort of we get on a treadmill of thoughts and we can't get off. And we find this going on and on. And instead of having peace, we have fear or anxiety or worry. Go with me now to Romans chapter 8. Romans 8. And Paul is going to, in verse 5, he's going to give us kind of the options of our thinking patterns, how we think. Verse 5 says, For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on things of the flesh. But those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For the mindset on the flesh is death. The mindset on the Spirit is life, and there it is again, in peace. Because the mind set on the flesh is hostile toward God, for it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. In other words, we either are going to have destructive thoughts or we're going to have constructive thoughts. One is going to come from our flesh. The other is going to come from the spirit. I can guarantee you that when your, your life and your mind is full of anxiety, worry, or fear, that's not from God. That's from your flesh. That's from you. You see, that's exactly, in that sense, what happens. It's a terrible thing to think about from that point of view. You see, in verse 4, he said, So that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk, that means live, according to the flesh, we live according to the Spirit. We have become new creatures in Christ. We are indwelt by the Spirit of God. But our thoughts have to be controlled by the Spirit of God. You see, that's the way this works. I can tell you one person you can't trust with your thoughts. That person in the mirror. You can't trust you. Proverbs says there is a way that seems right to a man. It ends in de death and destruction. You see, that's the case. Even those who reject the grace of God, reject Jesus Christ, they think this is good thinking. This is right. We're good. How's that going to end for them? You see, that's the way it is. The nat my natural fleshly way of thinking is antagonistic to the way God wants me to think. And the same thing is true for you. That's the problem that we have. Hmm. It's interesting that uh, this kind of thinking, God knows it's our problem. Just turn a couple pages to Romans chapter 12 with me just for a moment. Romans 12 in verses 1 and 2. Here Paul's going to say, look, one of the most important things of your Christian life is this. You have to change the way you think. Now that shouldn't shock anybody, but you have to change the way you think. And by and large, you're pretty good at it uh, in here. 
You're pretty good at it. Even in the lobby, you're pretty good. Now, I don't know from the parking lot on, I'm not with you. <laughs> but we're pretty good at it at certain spots. But when life hits and, and those kind of stressful circumstances come into our lives, we're not very good at it then. You see, we're not. Our default is us, and the default is destructive to us. Notice what Paul says. Verse 1, therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Now, that whole thing is, Paul says, if you're going to live the Christian life the right way, you make an offering to God, and the offering to God you make is you. God, I'm yours. That's an important thing. It's an heiress tense, which means we do it once. We make this, we make this offering to God. I mean, I can remember doing that in my own life. And the offering of God is just not the words. It means, God, I'll do anything, go anywhere, at any time, at any cost for you. And notice, Paul says that's what worship is. It's not coming on Sunday, singing a few tunes, and then going home. It's not worship. This is worship. My offering is me. Then he says this, do not be conformed to this world. Don't let this world, as J.B. Phillips says, squeeze you into its mold. By the way, it's the easiest thing in the world to do. Why? I'm already in the world. I already think like the world. He said, do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed, metamorphous. How? By the renewing of your mind. You see, the only way I'm ever going to do this is I have to change the way I think. That's such an important thing. He says that's the necessity of changing your thinking. That's the way Paul describes this. In Colossians 3, 2, Paul says this, set your mind on the things above, not on the things of earth. That is not easy to do. But once you do it, your whole life will change. See, once your mind is renewed to thinking in a different way, You've heard me say this in the past many times. The Apostle Paul was probably in his 60s. He had his own health issues, obviously. He had extra ones, a thorn in the flesh. And then he makes a list of all the things that he went through. And uh, it's hard for us to imagine this. They, say, they believe, by the way, he walked for thousands of miles in his 60s on rugged terrain. But then they, they beat him. They stoned him and left him for dead. They, they beat him with rods. He was imprisoned, shipwrecked, bitten by poison. I mean, it's a litany of things that none of us could say that was our life. Now, here's what Paul called all the things that happened to him. Momentary light afflictions. Now, you have one thing happen to you, and you don't call it that, do you? Oh, it's, oh, it's unbelievable. It's so horrible what's happening. Hmm. Why do we say that? Because of the way we think. You see, how did Paul get a perspective? It's momentary light afflictions. Because it's thought from above, not from below. He thought about it from an eternal point of view, not a temporal point of view. His thinking's different. He just says, I don't think that way. That's not how I think about things. This is just momentary. But it's terrible. It's fine. I'm going to be with the Lord forever. You know, a million years from now, you're not going to say, boy, that was a rough couple of years. You're not going to say that at all. Paul looked at it from a completely eternal perspective. Last week, we talked about Jesus in Hebrews 12, enduring the cross. The agony of the cross, the overwhelming agony of becoming the sin bearer of the world, being separated from the Father and having the wrath of God poured out at him. And it said he endured it because of the joy set before him. And I said last week, that joy is you, me. He's going to redeem a people for himself. He's going to call it the bride. So how did, how did he get through that? The way he thought. This is agonizing. I get that. But when I go down the road and think about it spiritually or eternally, I have joy about this. 
You see, that's the perspective difference of the way in which we think. And that's the problem that we often run into. Now, when we look at the focus of the thinking, go with me to 2 Peter chapter 1. He says in verse 5, Now for this very reason also, he's talking to us, applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence, and in your moral excellence, knowledge. Now knowledge is an issue of the brain. I need to think differently. Knowledge. And in your knowledge, self-control. And in self-control, perseverance. And in your perseverance, godliness. And in your God in this brotherly kindness, and in your brotherly kindness, love. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. See, what's the content of my thinking? It's Jesus. That's it. The true knowledge, he says, of Jesus Christ. In fact, in chapter 3 and verse 18 of 2 Peter, he says, Grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. If I had a wish list or a goal as a pastor for you that, help, that I can help you with, it's this. My prayer is that you fall deeper and deeper in love with Jesus. That's my prayer. And I'm going to tell you something. If you do, all the other stuff that we think is important isn't. You find two people that love Jesus more than anything, guess what kind of marriage they have? A really good one. Well, what kind of parents are you? You need technique. No, I don't. I need to love Jesus. I need to do as Jesus told me. What kind of neighbor am I? What kind of employee? Whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. You see, once I know Jesus, to know Jesus is to fall in love with Jesus. You see, it, he's not like a subject. He's a person. And so the idea is you need to know Jesus Christ. And I want to know Jesus Christ. That's the point, the focus of our thinking. Now, this, in a sense, has some aspects to it, and I want you to go with me to Philippians chapter 4. And we've been here over and over again. Let me give you the context. We were here last week, and 4.4 4 says, Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, Rejoice. Those are imperative moods in the Greek. I command you, rejoice. That's even awkward for us. You see, if you said, well, I'm having a problem, and you come into my office, you, you know, I'm really having a problem. I'm really struggling. I'm kind of melancholy. I'll tell you, be happy. I'm just telling you to be happy. You'd say, well, you can't tell me to be happy, can you? God just told us, Paul just said it, rejoice. Rejoice. It's an imperative mood. It's a commandment, just like the Ten Commandments. I'm commanded to rejoice. Well, I don't feel like rejoicing. You see how this works? Why do I not feel like rejoicing? Well, my thought process is this is bad, and I'm afraid. You see how this works? So he says, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Let your gentle spirit be known to all men. The Lord is near. Be anxious for nothing. Hmm. Do you really believe that? Do you really believe as a believer in Jesus Christ there's not one thing that can happen to you in your life that you should have any anxiety about? I mean, be honest with yourself. You really believe that? You see, I'm not sure we do at all. Well, I believe it when everything's going well in my life. But boy, I just got this diagnosis. I just found out what my employer told me. My spouse just told me they're thinking of leaving. 
how could I possibly have joy now? All I feel is anxiety. He says, be anxious for nothing. In everything, by prayer and supplication. The word supplication, I say it each time. Tell God how you feel. Give him the prayer. Tell him how you feel. God, I feel awful. God, I'm afraid. I need to tell you this. Then he gives us the key word from last week, or two weeks ago, with thanksgiving. I need to thank him. In my prayer, I don't need to thank him after it's over. Jesus is good all the time. Now, but last week he wasn't. You see, give him thanks now. Why, how can I thank him up front? He's God. Do you understand? He's God. I can always thank God for being God up front. I don't have to wait and see, and then I'll decide whether I want to thank him or not. No. Let your request be made known to God. And then he says, the result, the peace of God, which surpasses all comprehension, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Hmm. You see, then he wants to describe something. He knows where our problem is. The content of our thinking. We have to think differently. He said, let me give you some ideas of what you should be thinking about. By the way, when you're thinking about something that makes you anxious, worrisome, or fearful, what are you thinking about? Be honest, that thing. How much do you think about it? Uh, almost all the time. How about if you wake up in the middle of the night? Oh, boy, then I really think about it. That's all I think about. You see, that's the problem that we have. That's the mindset on the flesh. So he says, here we go. Finally, brethren, he says, let me give you these. The first thing, whatever is true. <laughs> whatever is true. Anything that's sourced in God. I can remember at Dallas Seminary, the first time I heard someone say it, Paul Meyer, who was a Christian psychiatrist, and uh, what he was talking about early on, what he said, we have to understand something. Everything that's true in this world, the source is God. If it's true, it came from God. He said, so whatever is true, wow. All truth originates with God. Are trials real? Is that a true statement? Yes, right? So I can't deny the trial. The trials are real. Is God sovereign? Well, yeah. But sometimes I think he forgets me. Does God love me? Yes. He loves me. Hmm. Has God given me the capacity to get through this? He has. And will this pass? Yes. It will pass. You see, that's all things that are true. The next word, he said, is whatever is honorable. The word would probably be better translated because of its origin, noble. Noble. Whatever is noble. The reason is that that use, uh, that use of the word noble was used in that part of the world to the idea of describing nobility or kings. Kings are different than people. And so kings have noble thoughts because they're kings. Well, who is Jesus Christ? Is he the king of kings and the Lord of lords? So whatever is noble... That's what I should think about. Then he says, and whatever is right. That word doesn't mean correct. Like we use right and wrong. No, it doesn't mean that. It means upright. That's what it means. Whatever is upright. What is the upright thing, the right thing to do in any situation that we find ourselves in? Fourthly, whatever is pure. Boy, is that hard to do in this culture. This is really bad in our culture. Genesis 6, 5. 
The Lord, this is the time of Noah. The Lord saw how great the wickedness of the human race had become on the earth and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. We're not there, but we're moving that direction. You see it constantly. I mean, you see it constantly. Jeez. Even the good things in life can be used for this. I mean, as, as wonderful as the internet is for us in communications, understanding knowledge and that, the internet is a cesspool of impurity. It's just unbelievable what especially children have access to in this world now, constantly, every day. You see, it has an enormous effect on us, to say the very least. <laughs> so whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is upright, whatever is pure, then he says, and whatever is interesting word, he said, whatever is lovely, <laughs> whatever contains love. Do you think about that a lot? It helps a lot. I think of my love, you see, for God. And then I think more about God's love for me. I think about my love for my wife and my sons and their families. I think about that. It's a wonderful blessing, isn't it? And yes, I think about my love for you and some of your love for me. You see, but that's a blessing. Just think if I thought about this an awful lot of the time. You see, that's such an important part of it. Whatever he said after that is of good repute. Admirable. Hmm. Are there any people you've met in your life that are admirable to you? I hope so. Just some people in your life. What a, what a good re reputation. What an admirable person. Just within the last year, the pastor of my home church, Pastor Dave, passed. And uh, to me, he was one of the most admirable people I've ever met. He had a humility about him and a brilliance that I'd never seen in anyone else. He's just that kind of man. When I went to Dallas Seminary, if you heard many times, Howard Hendricks, had such an enormous effect on me. I admired him so much. He had insights not into just the Lord and the Bible, but he had insights into people that I'll never forget. And he had a gifted way of communicating those things. And when I think about those men, I'm not thinking about me and the anxiety and the worry. You see, I'm thinking about something that's admirable to me. <laughs> he said then after that, he said, and if there's any excellence in anything worthy of praise, anything that's excellent, anything worthy of praise. Hmm. You say, well, where does this come into play then in my thought life, especially in the middle of the night? I'll take one of the things that's worthy of praise. Just going to try it for you. Try it for a few nights, see if it works for you. If you're having a really tough time with no peace, you're feeling the worry, the stress, the fear, whatever, and you wake up in the middle of the night, that's always an interesting time, isn't it? Your thoughts become a lot louder in some reason. There's no other distractions. And instead of focusing on that, which is my natural inclination, I begin to count everything God has blessed me with. From the time I was a little boy, the home I grew up in, the neighborhood, friends, just started going through high school, meeting the love of my life, uh, the life we made together, family, all this. I just start through it. Guess what? It's better than counting sheep. <laughs> because once you start ta thinking about all the things that you've had in your life, all the blessings that God has given you, guess what gets pushed out of your thoughts? Oh, this is really bad. I don't know what I'm going to do. This scares me. You see how this works? 
that's, that's worthy of praise. And that, I think that is such an important part of this. So that's the list. Charles Spurgeon, the great English preacher, said, The highest science, the loftiest speculation, the mightiest philosophy, which can ever engage the attention of the child of God, is the name, the nature, the person, the work, the doings, and the existence of the great God who he calls Father. He said, There is something exceedingly improving to the mind in the contemplation of the divinity. It is a subject so fast that are so vast that our thoughts are lost in its immensity and so deep that our pride is drowned in its infinity. That's our thinking of God. That's the way this whole thing works. You see, you are what you think, much more than you think you are. And so you have to ask yourself the question, how are my thoughts doing? Is this the way I think? You see, am I renewing my thinking, as Paul says in Romans 12? Is that happening in my life, or is it not? And we're all going to have times when we need it. I found this story this week. It is about a missionary named Jeffrey Bull. He was a Scottish missionary, and he was captured and imprisoned by Chinese communists in Tibet. His possessions, including his Bible, were stripped from him, and he was thrown into a series of prisons where he where he suffered terribly for three years. In addition to extreme temperatures, almost no food, and miserable conditions, Bull was subjected to such mental and psychological torture that he feared he would go insane. But he had studied his Bible all his life, and so he began to systematically go through the scripture in his mind. He found that it took him about six months to go all the way through the Bible mentally. He started in Genesis and thought, what do I remember from these chapters? And worked his way through the Bible. It says, he recalled each incident and story the best he could, first concentrating on the content, then musing on certain points, seeking light in prayer. He continued through the Old Testament, reconstructing the books and chapters as best he could and focusing his thoughts on verses he knew by heart, then into the New Testament and on to Revelation. And then he started over again. He later wrote after this experience, the strength received through this meditation was, I believe, the single most important factor in bringing me through. And it kept me to be faithful to the very end. So what did he change? Was the food better? The torture less? The temperature? The enemy? Nothing changed. But his thinking changed. Just like Jeffrey Bull, if you fill your mind with Jesus Christ and his word, you actually will be practicing the presence of God in your life. Think about it. Let's pray. Father, the mind is a wonderful thing that you've given us. We have incredible capacities of imagination and understanding But Father, sometimes our mind can become our own worst enemy. We can fixate on thoughts, not thoughts about you, about truth, about Christ, about the Spirit of God within us, but about circumstances. And we allow those thoughts to dominate our thinking. And it robs us of our peace. It robs us of our joy. It robs us of our hope because we're thinking incorrectly. Father, I pray that each of us challenge ourselves to try to begin to think differently and by doing so to practice your presence in our lives. We pray this for our good and for your glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand as we close the service by singing together? devotion 
indeed everything that we need. May our thoughts be all about Him. Amen. <laughs> 